because I get different responses from you guys. Um, did you guys study the Holocaust when you guys when you were in middle school? Yes. Uh, seventh grade. Okay. Because I get different responses where sometimes people say, you know, we had a little bit of it. Some people had a lot of it. Would you guys kind of tell me so I understand? Did you? You guys said you had it in seventh grade. I studied it. I did it because I went to a Jewish middle school. Language arts, okay. All right, mm -hmm. okay. Yes, ma'am. I studied it in third grade because uh, I went to a Jewish private school. So okay. Kind of, so kind of from various uh, uh, times, okay. All right. So here's the thing. What we're going to do today is we're going to talk about really the beginnings of it, and we're going to get all the way through when it's actually really discovered on the international level. So first thing, we got to talk about how this really truly begins. Now, when we were talking about the rise of the totalitarian dictatorships, we talked about how in Hitler's book, he writes about the worldwide Jewish conspiracy against the German army in World War I. Now, when we were covering World War I, we talked about how there's no big climactic battle. It's not just all in at one point. World War I just kind of stops. And you have no foreign troops in Germany when it comes to an end. And Adolf Hitler starts to think through this in his mind, and he says, we must have been stabbed in the back. We must have been betrayed. There must be a worldwide Jewish conspiracy against us. In Hitler's mind, he starts thinking about how this could possibly take place. And the more he thinks about it, he writes about this in his book, where he says there has to be accountability for this. There has to be retribution. But he never really outlines what his final solution to Europe's Jewish problem should be. Now, probably in his mind and privately, he did discuss it. But publicly, he never brought this up. In fact, publicly, what his plan was, was to literally take the Jews of Europe and just move them somewhere else. In fact, he says publicly, he wants to move them to Madagascar. It's kind of this weird thing where you are saying, how do you even think about that? Like, is that really what you believe will solve your demented problem? What it turns into, though, is death on an industrial scale. Now, I always kind of have a difficult time trying to explain it because you have to understand, in the Nazi regime, you got promoted based on how psychopathic you were. This is what they valued. If you had this inclination of humanity or sympathy, you didn't rise through the ranks. So when you see the people that are at the top of the Nazi regime, they're the most sadistic. The people who organize the Holocaust are madmen, and they get promoted because of it. So the people that organize it and the people who run it are absolute psychopaths. And now they're in positions of power. The Holocaust is designed to go after various groups of people that Hitler and his henchmen are deemed to be the Untermenschen, the subhumans. And they kind of base decisions off of this perverted science that was uh, going through Europe at the time called eugenics, where they said, we could, as a society, weed out different genetic uh, weaknesses. If we just systematically breed people, we can create a super race of people. Now, what they deemed to be the superior race was the master Aryan race. Now, we talked about this when we first got started. It's a group of people that Hitler and his henchmen almost like make up in their minds. And the definition varies based on what Hitler wants. So in their minds, the Aryan race were descendants of the lost city of Atlantis. 
and they said the Aryans have these different traits about them. And I think I told you guys before that Hitler kind of had like a ranking system where he said, oh, the Nordic people are really close to Aryans. They're tall, they have blonde hair and blue eyes, and they fit these characteristics. But when Hitler signs a deal with the Japanese, he says, oh yeah, Japan's Aryan too. He just tweaks his definition for whatever he wants. He sends archeologists all over the world to find evidence of the Aryans. They go to Tibet and they find skulls and they say, oh yeah, this is definitely an Aryan skull. All just to justify what they're doing. It's a huge scale that they have. Any race or group that they deem to be the Untermenschen, they just classify as weakening the Aryan race. Now, they put multiple groups of people into this Untermenschen classification, where Hitler and his henchmen say that any kind of genetic defect makes you eligible for either sterilization or elimination. So they deemed a bunch of these groups and put them together. Hitler kind of has this list and he says any kind of mental illness, physical weakness, even a religious affiliation, like the Jehovah's Witnesses, they're considered Untermenschen. He changes this as he goes as well. Eventually the communists are Untermenschen, which means the Russians are Untermenschen. Homosexuals, gypsies, they all get lumped together and Hitler says, we are just simply going to get rid of these people to make way and purify the Aryan race. In order to do that, Hitler needs his shock troops. He needs the SS or the Schutzstaffel. It translates to the protective shield of Germany. The SS were the most radical, the most ideologically committed to what the Nazis wanted to do. And the SS are some very scary individuals. The SS was above the law. They could do whatever they wanted, but there's only one thing that they need to be certain is absolutely in line. They are 100% dedicated and loyal to Adolf Hitler. In fact, if you wanted to be in the SS, you had to prove five generations of pure Aryan blood. You had to prove your genetics. And then Hitler had to approve of your chosen bride as well. She had to prove five generations of Aryan genetics. And what Hitler did, this is a little bit later, oh, this is as the war is kind of probably about halfway through, he would say that the Waffen SS needs to quote unquote breed throughout Europe. They had, quite literally, girls as young as about 14 breed with the SS. They had to be state approved to simply just make more Aryan children. And the young babies were simply taken by the state. They were raised to be Aryans. This is where Hitler and his henchmen go with their final solution to Europe's Jewish problem. It's on a scale that's thought to be unimaginable until it happens. Now the system that they created is something that it's just eerie to see how this extermination gets to such a level. Jews and these other groups of the Untermenschen are simply just herded onto trains. Now you guys saw in Germany how they kind of slowly chipped away at humanity. How they just one at a time stripped away these rights and protections until they were seen as second class citizens. When the war begins and Germany starts expanding rapidly, they don't have to do it slowly. They just start rounding up these groups of people, putting them on the trains, and send them to really one of two types of camps. There are forced labor camps, 
and they're simply just death camps, just extermination centers. Now, the big death camps, there's going to be about eight of them throughout Europe, and the scale of it is just hard to really wrap your mind around. But the labor camps had a bit of a different purpose. The labor camps are designed to simply work people to death. Now, there are numbers that are thrown out, and it's hard to deem what's accurate, but I'll tell you the number that I've heard about kind of most frequently. It said that during the Nazi war effort, they had slave labor making the tools of war. They were in factories. They were building ammunition. They were building bombs. They were building guns and tanks and planes. Again, hard to say exactly, but probably about 40% of everything that the Nazi government made to fight the war was made by slave labor. Now, Hitler always deemed these people to be the subhumans, and in fact, he uses a phrase that Stalin came up with, he says, these people are worthless calorie eaters. I have plenty of people that can be the slave labor, as he says, but we need to make it cheap. We need to make it cost effective. So the way these labor camps would be run is, they would simply work until they died. That's the cheapest way of running the camps. You can't feed them enough to keep them going. So every day, they're at a caloric deficit. They burn more calories than what they take in. It's by design. It's to keep costs down. For seven days a week, sun up to sundown, these slave labor camps would just be run round the clock to produce the tools necessary to keep the war going. And these people were routinely denied enough food to stay alive. It sets up some very creepy stories from survivors. People that revert back to kind of the most basic instincts. People that had, um, there are dozens and dozens of people who tell these stories. They say, we would do whatever it took to get enough food to survive. People would sharpen their fingernails. They would file their teeth to points and simply just attack anyone else in the camp that had food. This is what they did. It's what they had to do to survive. Now, if we shift and kind of talk about the death camps, it gets to be on a whole other scale. The death camps are designed for really one thing. It's just mass extermination just death on a huge scale. So if you were sent to the death camps, on the trains, these trains would be packed so tight with people that these train, uh, what it would take to get to the death camps, sometimes it would take up to 12 days to get there. People are being shipped from all over Europe. And there are countless stories of people that on the train, there are plenty of people that don't even make the trek. They die on the train. But they're so compactly placed in there that the dead can't even fall over. You don't know who's dead until you get out of the train and you see the bodies collapse. Now, when you did get out of the train, if you survived, you were greeted by an SS officer. And he simply had two choices. If he deems you to be healthy enough to work, he just points to the left. If he looks at you and believes you're too old or sick or weak to work, just points to the right. Eventually, they get the nickname of the Angel of Death. They determine who dies that day. If he sends you to the right, your fate's been decided. You're going off to mass, ex excuse me, mass extermination. Now, if you were the one sent to the left, they would simply ship you off to a different concentration camp throughout Europe. Now again, talking numbers, 
there's going to be right about, and you kind of have to do it give or take because some of them are huge in scale and some are very small in scale.